I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... My name is Sean Chappell. I am the sole proprietor of Red Fracture, which is uh, an online concern trying to sell t-shirts. My big announcement was essentially that I I quit my job to follow my passion. I want to know a little bit about taking that leap because that's pretty cool. And also, like, what led up to that? I've been doing the art thing since forever. Mm -hmm. I basically, you know, was born uh, with a crayon in my hand. And it was just it's one of those things that um, there was actually an old crayon drawing under one of our old tables, our kitchen table. When it got sold or when my my father moved from his old house, I actually wanted to take a a skill saw to it and cut that piece out (laughs) because it was underneath. You couldn't see it. I wanted to frame it as my very first squiggle. That's cool. Something like that. But I've been doing it since forever and I really want to do it full time. It's what I love. Uh Um, It's all I am. It's a 24-7 head full of art and creativity. So I've been trying to do it as a business uh, since forever and it just really hasn't panned out. It hasn't the money isn't there. The support isn't there. It sort of came to the realization after the last couple of years of trying to really be professional about it, get the website up and running. I've got a, I'm on the Shopify platform. I'm going to their seminars. I'm learning about marketing, the community. What's the best way to approach what I'm trying to do? And I really came to the realization that uh, unless I do it full time, I can't devote the right amount of energy to it to make it work. It just, it doesn't work part-time. You can't do it. You can't build any business. Chances are on eight hours a a week. I listen to a lot of inspirational books or business books or things that are about changing your mindsets, uh, like Carol Dweck's mindset, Bernard Roth's The Achievement Habit. And the the book that I listened to recently that really kind of clued it all or uh, pulled it all together for me was Jen Sincero's uh, You're a Badass at Making Money. Oh, not familiar with that one. Okay. It is, it is awesome, and it actually hit on so many things I was feeling. She, she basically goes through her journey from going from earning nothing to being a multimillionaire doing what she loves, mm-hmm. and it hit on so many things that I was feeling at the time that I just realized I have to leap from what I do full-time as a stainless steel metal fabricator And jump into my business uh, if I'm going to do it. (laughs) Well, you can't just say stainless steel metal fabricator and just go buy that one. So what does that (laughs) entail? That industry since I was 20, well, almost 20 years now. Really? So, yeah, chances are, at least locally here, at least in in Canada, I don't know how far afield my my influence goes. But if you've you've eaten anything that's uh, prepackaged and and like Campbell's Soup or Delicio Pizza's, or any of that type of processed food, mm-hmm. or you've eaten any meat from a maple leaf plant, maple lodge, any of that type of stuff, yeah. I've probably had a hand in it somewhere. Huh? You'd be surprised. I've piped in huge plants and put in enormous uh, conveyor systems and tank systems and all kinds of control systems for food and pharmacy for 20 years. How the hell do you get involved in something like that? Uh, my father was actually a, a journeyman in okay. England. And when they came to Canada, he found a job uh, at a plant that makes right now. The only thing it makes now is Hall's candy. You know the. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. It's for for like uh, cough and colds. Yeah, like Vicks Vapor season, Action right? or whatever the hell. Yeah. Okay. That's it. When he first came to Canada, he picked up a job with them as a journeyman and kind of worked his way into project manager. What's a journeyman? It's an old timey word, essentially for machinist. Uh, run a lathe, run a mill, um, and knew basically everything about machining parts. Okay. So he worked in their in-house machine shop for years and years and years. And eventually all that got subbed out uh, for one reason or another. And he kind of worked his way into management. And that is how he offered me a job with the company who serviced their new, their, their plant now. And okay. I kind of found my way in that way. Lots of stuff where I would hurt myself completely because I'm horrible with tools. Oh, um, you don't want to see the, <laughs> <laughs> the scars. I'm s- Oh, I this, bet. this last month that I've been off, I actually haven't cut my hands once I, or once. Oh. I had a paper cut, I think. It's been fantastic not to have burns, cuts, yeah. band-aids and all the rest of it. I don't have to worry too much now that I'm just sitting and airbrushing. I probably have more of an office worker's issues now with, with sedentary lifestyle problems mm-hmm. than where I was before with hurting my back or hurting my knees or something like that. Yeah. 
And you say, uh-huh. so you say you airbrush is, is the way that you do your stuff. I've it is now. It yes. Is. Okay. Um, I picked that up about three years ago. A friend of mine, I've been, I've been painting with acrylics since high school. Uh, a teacher introduced me to acrylics because I only thought it was oils. I thought that was painting. That was what you did. I tried oils as a kid. My parents got me a set for Christmas. They were fun to blend, but they never dried. It took months. They took months. I sat them. They were sitting actually on top of a, a grow light that we had where we were doing some seedlings. Uh, we, we lived out in the country. So we were doing some, some gardening plants early in March. And I had these paintings and they sat there for months and I go in every every week and touch them still wet touch them still wet it's like jeez this stuff's uh, terrible like some part of the process you must have been missing because I I have heard that it takes them forever to dry but they do eventually dry I think they do oh yeah absolutely absolutely huh. um and, and a lot of modern painters they um they use uh, a chemical there's one called liquid that you can use which actually speeds the drying time oh, okay of oils so there's there's some chemical chicanery that goes on in the background of a lot of oil painters. How did you end up moving into airbrushing? Well, all of all of the painting technique that I was doing was trying to get smooth blends and oil like look with my acrylics. Mm-hmm. I, and I just it was time consuming and really labor intensive. And a friend let me try his airbrush one day, and I realized that I can get all these nice smooth blends with an airbrush, quick and dirty. And uh, they look great. They look exactly like what I was looking for. So I ended up going to pick one up and it took some trial and error to get get the paint right. Uh, You can buy airbrush paint, which is thinned down and has the right pigments in it uh, for the consistency of the airbrush, because the aperture in the end of it is really tiny. It's 0.35 millimeters or something like that, or it's, it's really small. It's like the head of a pin, essentially, or, or the point of a pin, because that's that's your needle goes through it. But after that, I kind of figured it out. And I've been, because of my, my fabrication experience, I've been TIG welding, which is a, a form of welding, which is really specific and really prissy. It's almost like being, I would uh, say it's akin to being a dentist. You have a tiny a torch in your hand, and you have a little filler rod, and you've got to gently make these really nice connections with the stainless. So when it came to hand-eye coordination with the airbrush, which is essentially a very similar kind of apparatus, it didn't take a lot for me to get used to the feel of it and to get moving kind of with it. I'm already, I was already kind of there with my, with my welding. Going from one to the next was actually not that tough. And because I've been training myself for 20 years to try to get sort of an illusory effect with my artwork, doing that also didn't take a lot of time. I didn't really have to figure out how to make form or create that illusion of, of three dimensionality. It was already in my head. So I just needed to really figure out the flow with the airbrush and I've kind of got that wired up tight now. So it's, it's working really well for me. I love it. I yeah. wish I found it 20 years ago. I wish my, I wish my teacher back in high school had put that airbrush in my hand <laughs> rather than a, than a paintbrush because I'd be somewhere else right now. decided to quit what you were doing and go into it for yourself. Like what was the one thing? Now I know you said you needed to be able to do it full time. You realized that what was your, Oh, that's what I need to do moment when you were reading that book that you were telling me about. Yeah. Uh, Jensen Cheryl's book there. To be honest, I don't think it was one moment. Yeah. I think it was more her, her journey that really was parallel to my own. So before she decided to jump ship and get into things full time for herself, she was, seeing the same problems hitting the you know the same same walls falling in the same pits that i was you know i'm putting in 200 hours into this thing and if i can't sell it for fifty thousand dollars, i'm not making any money of course and if i can't find somebody to buy it then i'm not making any money or i'm doing a commission but it takes me a hundred hours and i'm getting a hundred dollars for it i'm not making any money it was sort of that's uh, the business side of it that was never really coming to me. The creativity side of what I do has always flowed for me. I've never, I've never hit a brick wall with writer's block, as it were, but for artists, yeah. uh, artists block, uh, that's never been a, a problem for me. I have so many ideas in my sketchbooks that I, I could probably never have another new idea and never run out of stuff to do. If, if there's anything, maybe that's what I should actually do. I should just be an idea man. Come to me. You pay me so much money for an idea and I will I will give you something from my book. Uh, you know, that, that character from Elf, uh, it's the gentleman from uh, Game of Thrones. The, oh, okay. Peter Dinklage. 
Peter Dinklage, yes. He shows up and he's there to save the day uh-huh. and he's got a book of ideas. They need an idea for a new book and he shows up with this mystical book. Ooh, this <laughs> book of ideas. And that's that's his job essentially is to rescue you with a new idea. Okay. And so maybe, kind of like uh, the uh, Harvey Keitel character <laughs> in Pulp Fiction. He's the guy that comes up and goes, <laughs> yeah. here's how we're going to fix this. Maybe I should do that. I don't know. But it was, I think for, for me, it was her parallel, her just her journey through that book and the way she tells it and the straightforwardness of it. I listened to a lot of other books by like authors like Brene Brown, who has a huge following and she's all about mindset and following your passion. But I listened to three or four of her books and they were basically all self-referencing each other. There was nothing new in any of her new books. You know, she just repackaged it for business people or for housewives. That's kind of what I mean, too, is that it can apply. It's just it doesn't necessarily have to apply to artists, too. It can also apply for like many different things. And also each business, somebody started that business, regardless of what field is in, like even in the the one that you were telling me about before that you were in the fabricator, even that like somebody had to start that it can apply everywhere. And that's what I mean by like, there's some moment where it's like, that's how this applies. And that's the beauty of it. Think of that story like in the thing that you like to do. You learn to apply it in a way that will maybe even make you think of something that's a little bit more unique, kind of like learning GIMP from a Photoshop tutorial. There's, yes. You can do the same thing on both. You just have to figure out how to do that method in here because everything's all switched around and different. Exactly. I think I think for her, uh, what, she, what she was talking about, for me, I, I, she was a writer and an author. And essentially, that's where she's had huge success, it was not only with her books, but also with her coaching, which is what her books are based on, her business coaching and her model of, of that. And I think it's because she was a fellow creative that it's, uh, it did clue in for me. It was really kind of a like a no brainer. She's just putting all the little blocks in my own life. And I was just following along. And I'm like, that's me. And that's me. And that's me. And I got to quit this shit if I'm going to get this done. My, my goal at the beginning of this year of, of 2019 was to actually take my business, Red Fracture, and build it to the point where I could walk away from my job, that it would become my sole income. You know, there's all these great new models out there. I had a great new website, drop shipping t-shirts from the US, you know, so it's no fuss. I don't have to carry any product. I don't have to put in any capital up front. It's an easy model to do, but I wasn't able to work on it at all. And it just kind of sat there doing nothing. Nobody was coming to the site. Nobody knew about what I was doing. Right. I wasn't producing any new ideas, new designs. And so it really was, it was all about that. It was like, either you, you get after it or let it go. That was, that was it for me. I really had to foot down. If we're going to do this, let's do it. First of all, who are you drop shipping through for your t-shirts? Uh, right now it's through Printful. Ah, I've been using that too. I like it. Yeah, <laughs> they, they actually, I, I test marketed a bunch of stuff through another company called Printify. Yeah. They have different providers depending on who's up. I mm-hmm. think at that time, like, because companies are kind of, I'm, I'm producing, I'm not producing, I'm, you know, and they kind of bounce. Right. So the quality was really a hit and miss. So yeah. I got a, you know, a test shirt from that company and a test shirt from that company. And I did three or four different ones through Printify and they were all terrible. Hmm. Um, the, the quality, you know, one wash and they were all cracked and peeling, really uh. crummy, cheap, but you get what you pay for. That's how it was. So I tried uh, Printful next and I still have the one that I test ordered from a year ago and it's still great. It's still awesome. So I've, I've been really happy with their quality. They cost a little more. So the profit margin through them is not as much. But I mean, if you're selling a thousand t-shirts a day, what does it matter? Ben Story was a, a guy that I talked to and he was doing print on demand shirts. And he was telling me about how he has tons of shirts that he put out there that he goes, you wouldn't know that they were mine. And he's like, and I'm not going to tell you they're mine because what he does is he'll do like the kind of stuff you would see if you went on vacation and you were in a tourist spot. Like he would do right. stuff like you're going to buy that just because it's like an impulse buy. And it's like, oh, that's funny. And he right. I guess he has tons of that stuff out there. And that's how he was actually making money doing print on demand. So are you right. doing anything like that? Not yet, but I actually have some ideas for taking some of my quirky personality and, and not just doing sort of the, the fine art thing on T-shirts, which is basically what I've done. I've taken my my fine art imagery and, and put it on a T-shirt, uh, but to actually yeah. take some of the, the quirky sense of humor that I have maybe make some more visual puns and things like that to give a clever twist to t-shirts, you know, because they can be, 
they can be anything. I mean, you can make them serious. They can be funny. They can be political. They can be a one-off tour thing, like like Ben's shirts. It's a, it's a really interesting and open format for whatever you want to say. Have fun. Be mm-hmm. serious. Have a moment. Create a memory. Whatever it is. So I want to actually start getting into that as a way of offering another side of myself, essentially, because I do like I like horror movies. Uh, and I like writing and I like puns and I like jokes and I like dark humor. And there's a way to kind of, I think, to blend it all together to make something that's fun, more more meant for a T-shirt. I think I'm not quite sure if what I'm doing just now with the, with the fine art, sort of more tattoo looking artwork is necessarily meant for a T-shirt or maybe the application is not quite right yet. What would you uh, we'll say see. your style is? I hesitate to call it surrealistic just because... I'm not sure it's quite there. It's kind of, it's, it's part of the, the outsider lowbrow pop surrealist kind of movement that's started up uh, in America in sort of the the seventies, eighties. I'm sort of still riding in that vein. And I try to keep things somewhat realistic with, with the way that I produce the imagery because of what I do is so fantastical. I sort of decided a long time ago, if people were going to believe it or, consider it something uh, uh, worthy of appropriating or uh, acquiring for, for their own collection or whatever it is, then it better look good. It had to have that pizzazz of a realistic kind of thing, you know, so that they could believe it. And so I've been sort of pushing that way my entire life. More of the show after this break. Now that you're going into business for yourself, what are you working up to? Like, what's your one-year plan so far? Now that I have jump ship, I'm operating under my own steam. I'm back into uh, working on my website and getting that organized. I don't think it was working very well. So people were coming to it. And as an e-commerce thing, you really have to think about that customer experience. They're not just walk. They're not walking through a door and then seeing a boutique anymore. It's now it's it's right in front of them on a screen. So you have to think a little differently. You have no web experience, right? Not much. I mean, I've run my own website for years. Right. Uh, I, I had a lot of gallery websites, and I've I've done some stuff through WordPress, and uh, tried a couple of different platforms. But this is my first sort of I'm going to pay for it professional website through Shopify. And I'm still I'm still doing the work myself, but now I'm getting the support of Shopify. And I have access to their professionals and their, their learning sessions and all that stuff. So even though I'm paying, it's not just for a website, it's for a whole body of learning and experience that I can access. Right. And but you're not like fit. coding it from the ground up or getting in the back end and like, yeah, that's, that's what I meant. No. It's like you're using the platform is basically. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's, it's a lot of plug and play. There's a customizability. Is that a word? I'm not quite sure that's a word, but it is now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll allow so you it. Can, you know, <laughs> change the font, change the color, change the layout. Right. You can do that sort of stuff, but there's okay. a, there's a basic architecture to all of the stuff that they support. Yeah. It's a lot of plug and play. It's easy. So now, now that I'm here at this point, uh, it's been about a month since I, I quit. I quit just at the beginning of November. And yeah, so it's, it's been about getting that, that platform, the e-commerce platform back together, getting back in touch with Shopify. So I've taken some courses with them and done some one-on-one stuff with some professionals there to kind of vet my website and how it looks. I've actually been approaching people in the community trying to find like a support system essentially for entrepreneurs and small business and to find people who are in in the same situation as me to start friendships and partnerships and trying to do all those things I couldn't do when I was working 60, 70 hours a week at being a fabricator. So I've turned all that time now into building what Red Factor needs to be. And hopefully by the end of one year, I mean, I've only got, (laughs) I only have so much, uh, money to live off of before I start, you know, having to go to credit and, right. and home equity and stuff like that. You know, yeah. I, I, I am willing to go bankrupt to try to make this happen, but I'd really like to not go there if I can help it. Of course. After one year, I really want, I want this e-commerce platform to be operating at a point where there's continuous passive income coming in off of my designs, off of my tees, uh, off of some of my original art, any anything I could turn it into prints. I want to try to keep the the number of products that I offer to a, a certain number. You know, yeah. you can you can with drop shipping nowadays, you can take your image and you can put it on a pen, yeah. and on a mug, and on a pillow, and on and I I don't want to 
uh, totally. I think there's a, a website called Zazzle. Yes. Uh, which will do that for you. You can throw it on anything you want. And I, I kind of want to start a brand. I want it to be very specific. I'm trying to keep it to a dull roar when it comes to all the products that I offer. But what I do offer, I want it to, in, inside of Euro, I want it to be running itself to a degree so that I can focus on creating new designs, uh, creating new opportunities, uh, yeah. rather than having to sit behind the computer and constantly work every day trying to get more t-shirt sales. I started up a YouTube channel to talk about my journey. So every week I produce another video saying, here's a couple of things that I did this week and I'll go into depth. Which I think is I, smart. Yeah, it, well, I, I think people would really be interested in knowing the behind the scenes. You know, I, it's it's not just a pretty wrapped a picture in a frame anymore. Like here's here's the dirty work that goes on behind the scenes. If you're thinking of doing what I'm doing, you might find this of use. And I'd like to eventually outsource that. I would like to be able to shoot the video, right. send some some and say this is what this here's the format and I'd like to be able to give it to somebody else to actually do the editing because once I shoot it, which takes about 5 minutes, it takes me about four hours to edit the damn right. thing and put it together. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, for for that that five, it's amazing how long five minutes can really be. I, I'd really rather be able to just give it to a professional company and say, here's some money. You please take care of this for me while I do the artwork that's going to be the next big thing for, for Red Fracture. And aside from going to giving a, a company money, I mean, you could see this as an opportunity to with the network or the community that you've been talking about, I mean, is, aren't there people out there you could reach out to people who do video or people going to school for video and go, I'm doing Absolutely. this thing. And then you would meet them and then they know somebody like I've met people through the intern I have, he's a musician and I also do music as well, aside from what I'm doing here. And right. I've, I've learned lots of stuff from him, not from like, Hey, connect me to this. We're just talking. And he's like, Oh, we got this. Uh, I think they just played, Michigan recently or something like that. They'll play places. And he's like, Oh, we just did a thing with this band. And I'm like, how are you getting these shows? And then he just tells me like, Oh, this and that. And through the conversation, it's like light bulbs will start going off just from the conversation. And I'm not asking them to hook me up. I'm just talking with them. And it's like, Oh yeah, that's how you're doing it. Cool. You know? And, yeah. and then I get a bunch of ideas. So maybe that's something too. Like they're learning something from you. You're learning something from them. I don't know. It's, it's I'm just not a bad idea. throwing it out there, you know. So, and that's that's one of those things that I've been missing because I've been giving so much of my time to somebody else's company for so long. I don't have those connections in the community. That's where I am now. That's what I'm I'm jumping into. So recently, I, I applied for uh, an opportunity for a business grant. Oh, cool! Uh, through through Kitchener City Hall, and I was invited into the program. You and were? I was all overjoyed. I thought, oh, I got a grant. I got a grant. I got to get $5,000. <laughs> Woo! Uh, no. No. It's, uh, it turns out that I, I still have to write the business plan. Right. I still have to go to the mentoring sessions, and I still have to do the pitch. Yeah. And there's there's 25 grants for 50 people. So it's so I have to float to the top, as it were. You know. So I, I feel very confident about it just because yeah. of where I'm at in my head and I have all the time in the world to to throw at this, and you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get that grant. While I was there, I was meeting other people in different companies, right? There, because it's all small companies, it's all sole proprietorships or small businesses, going for these grants. And I was meeting up with mentors in the community who work through the small business center, who are also entrepreneurs in their own rights, depending. Mm -hmm. right? Everybody's kind of got a side hustle, regardless. And it was great just having a, a talk with this person and a talk with that person, and they do. They say exactly what what they're up to. Oh, well, this is what I do on YouTube. And this is what's worked for me. Or mm -hmm. here's a friend of mine. You should give her a call. She's she's really good at media relations. Maybe you can chat with her about what you're trying to do. Or, oh, I know a guy who's an Im importer, and he can get you those uh, tropical plants that you're trying to resell to millennials for so much cheaper, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever it is. Um, there are all kinds of businesses there, and those connections are great. You're absolutely right. Just to, just to talk. <laughs> One of the other things Sean has been doing is creating a game called Honey Bomb. Honey Bomb is our first game, and it came out a chat. We met up with a couple of other local artists, my wife and I, and uh, we were having a talk at Williams, which is a, a cafe up here. We were sitting there one day. It was three hours, three and a half hours for a coffee, and we were just having the greatest time. And there's this game that we played at camp when I was 14. And essentially it was, I'm going to give you a scenario. You have to figure out how the man died. Mm. And all the guy says is there's a man dead in a phone booth. Go. 
And you can only ask him sort of yes or no questions. Uh, is the man tall? That's a uh, delightful yes. children's game, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, the counselors, we were 14. The counselors were probably just out of high school themselves. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I did that at the cafe for everybody. And it took us 45 minutes to finally come out with the answer, which I'm not going to say because it's really, it's really fun. Uh, you should look it up. It is online. It's an old gag. Uh, I, I heard it back almost 30 years ago. So it's, it's out there. It's in the world. But essentially we said, wouldn't that make a great podcast? Uh, wouldn't that make a great something if we were to sit around and have these ideas about a month later, we were kind of sitting around having, I'm having this thought in my head about how do I make red fracture work? You know, artwork. My wife is an author and a writer, and she's kind of in the same boat. She's trying to mm. get her books out there into the world and to to make a business of it. Uh, and we both seem to sort of be hitting the same sort of wall in that art is static and books are static, and it takes somebody to give their energy to it, to interact with it. They have to interface with it. It's not the same as a television program or a movie or a rock concert where somebody is doing doing the work for you. You just have to passively kind of watch. Like live performance, everything has an entertainment and a performance to it, whereas a painting on a wall and a book don't until you pick them up and get involved. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, how can I take art and how can my wife take writing and how can we put them together so yeah. that... We can make something that is entertaining. It's it, it has its entertainment value built into it. And that thought of Williams and us chatting about that poor dead man in the telephone booth came to came to my mind. And I said, why don't we make a game? I said, that was perfect. We had so much fun trying to figure out how that poor man passed away that we could we do that. I'll I will do the image. It'll be exactly what it is. And it'll be like a, tw a macabre 20, 20 questions kind of game where uh, the person who is the question answerer has the answer in front of him and nobody else can see it. And so he's got all the information in front of him, what it is. And you do this thing and it's a party game. And we talked, we batted that around back and forth a bit and decided that it wasn't quite right because the actual playability of it was only a one-time sort of thing. Once you did it, you kind of knew the knew the mystery of it. It was, wasn't going to be so much fun. But it got me thinking about games uh, and about becoming an entertainment company because our, our other friends at Williams are all gamers. Uh, we like games, tabletop gaming specifically, and video games, of course, are, are a huge part of life nowadays. And so it just kind of went from one thing to the next, and I started having all these ideas, just creative insights for making games. And the first one I came up with was something called Swarm, which is essentially a hexagonal game where you put down, you have a stack of hexagon, hexagons, mm -hmm. they have a stack of hexagons, and they're double-sided. And essentially, you put one down, they put one down, they put one down beside yours, and take yours if it's sandwiched between two of theirs, and so on and so forth, Yeah, you kind of go around. And it changes shape as it moves on the table, and because you move from here, you move to there. And it's called Swarm. And we thought, okay, well, let's give it a B theme. Why don't we take some of the stuff we know from apps on our phone and make some specialty cards? So you don't just move this card to there. You can actually have a specialty card that you put down on top of this, and it changes that dynamic of the game, blah, 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 blah. And we got to Honey Bomb. It developed into a tabletop game yeah. with sort of... It, it's kind of chess-like and uh, go-like or Othello, those types of uh, strategy type games. Yeah. But it's got other elements of almost app-like like games where you drop something in and it changes this and you kind of get that. And we haven't quite figured out how to make like coins and rubies and things jump out of the out of the cards as well, you place them. We're working on that one. Yeah, hop two. <laughs> get on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's just, it's developed into, into a tabletop game and we're really, actually it's, it's a simple concept, but it's actually quite strategically tough to, to play and to be really good at. It's great. Uh, and it's going to feature all, all of my artwork. We're going to do it all in-house. So our friend Sabrina, who's working on it with my wife and I, Sabrina has all these insights into the gaming industry with friends who can actually build us an app afterwards. We're, we're thinking once we actually have a tabletop version of it to bring it to the electronic community if we can. She's looking after that and she's got all kinds of experience in the business side of things. So mm -hmm. she's writing up our partnership agreement and looking after a lot of the logistics behind the scenes. 
Whereas my wife is writing all of the copy and using her writing skills to bring together sort of her storytelling for the instructions and organizing up how all of that's going to look. And then I'm doing the artwork and we're kind of bringing all of our skill sets together. And it just, I don't know, it seems, it seems so natural. It all just kind of f- fell together really well. And now it's, now it's up to me to actually get the artwork done. Well, of course you can just have like a image coming soon on half the cards. <laughs> <laughs> the great thing again about, about modern manufacturing is we can upload it. Uh, we found a site that's out of Washington state and you can upload all of your images to their template and then send it back to them. How much does and something like make- that cost? For 20 games, like 20 full packs of 60 cards, and they're, they're, they're hexagon cards, and they're made of like that puzzle-like material, so they're, they're actually three-dimensional. They're, they're not just a playing card type card. They're actually, yeah. uh, the stack of them is about four inches tall. Uh, that costs about $300, I think, for okay. 20 packs, sort of. So it's, it's a small investment up front mm-hmm. to sort of get our testers in, and then we're going to start test playing it in the community locally. We're going to try to get people to play it and ultimately either to to say yes i love it or to break it and say this didn't work so well and to try to get ideas to make it better before we go to market with it do you have rpg in like tabletop community like places around town that you already have spoken to or like plan to approach or something like that we do actually yeah it's surprising now that we're getting into the board game communities it's huge yeah i had no idea like when i was a kid you know we played trivial pursuit and i had iq 2000 yeah. and i had a couple of other card games and battleship and sort of you know the the old standards and i never realized just how massive it is there are huge board game conventions around the world the biggest one in north america is actually uh, it's in, in indianapolis it's not too far from where we are it's actually about eight hours drive down uh, down to the U.S. for us. And that's the biggest one in North America. And then the biggest one in the world is in Germany. Huge industrial. It's it's basically like a trade show for for board games. That would be Uh, awesome if this all led to you going to Germany for your game. That's pretty cool. (laughs) I want to go. Actually, it's one of my dreams is to travel to Germany. And it's like it's all coming together again. Little Lego bricks are falling into place for me. So wow, hot damn. Yeah, well, <laughs> we'll figure awesome. it out. I mean, there's there's opportunity. I've been following a bunch of people who are making games through Instagram and chatting to them and sort of seeing what their journey is like. And I've been following a bunch of people on Kickstarter and sort of applying mm. to their to their games and supporting them. And I see if some people get the support they're looking for, some people don't. Even if we have a really great product we're still a little bit at the mercy of, of the market and who knows about it and who's willing to support it. And so there's all these things to think about. They say, uh, don't do it in January or February. Right. Nobody has any money because Christmas just came and everybody's broke. So they say, if you're going to, if you're going to kickstart something or launch it, don't, you know, wait till the spring. Yeah. Uh, and since, since we have a B theme, uh, we're actually going to be doing that anyways. It kind of all ties in. It's spring. The bees are coming out. The flowers are ready. Blah, blah, blah. Here's a new B game. Makes sense. Uh, yeah, why not? What we think of it doesn't matter all that much. It's, you know, if the community thinks it stinks, then it stinks. Yeah. And we, we're going to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> try, try something else. If you'd like to learn more about Sean Chapel, you can visit his website at redfracture.com. The music for this episode is by my band Lorenzo's Music at lorenzosmusic.com. And if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be back next week. So until then, so long.